do. Amen. Amen. <laughs> some folks can sing, some folks can't sing. I'm one of those that can't. Amen. If I want to torture you, I'll get up here and sing to you. Amen. <laughs> All right. If you have your Bibles, would you turn to the book of Revelation, chapter number 18, and verse number 23. Yes, sir. Lock you up in a cell, and for 24 hours a day, for a week, I'll sing to you. <laughs> Revelation chapter number 18 and verse number 23. And the light of a candle shall no more at all, shall shine no more at all in thee. The voice of the bridegroom, the bride shall be heard no more at all in thee. For thy merchants were the great men of the earth. For by thy sorceries were all nations deceived. And in her was found the blood of prophets and of saints and of all that were slain upon the earth. Her who? Go back and look at the context. Verse 10 of Revelation chapter 18. Father, I pray, Lord, that you bless your word now as it goes forth. May it fall upon good ground bring forth fruit in due time. I am tonight privileged just to sow it, Father, just to be a messenger. In thy name we pray, amen. There's quite a number of people who believe that modern America fulfills the prophecy of ancient Babylon and the prophecy of Babylon, the book of Revelation, chapter number 18. You can take a map of ancient Babylon and superimpose upon that map, in other words, a map of modern-day New York City, and it's remarkable at how close they align. And, of course, you know, that's, you say, well, that's an incidental thing. Yes, it doesn't prove anything. Uh, it doesn't prove that America is Babylon. But on the other hand, there's a lot about America that I love and a lot about America that I don't love. I've lived long enough in America to watch it change, and it hasn't changed for the better. It's changed for the worse. What you saw in... Uh, in uh, Char Charlottesville, Virginia. How many of you know the University of Virginia is located there? You know that Thomas Jefferson started the University of Virginia. And Thomas Jefferson was a great statesman, brilliant man, no question about it. And no question, he was one of the founding fathers of our nation. But I have tried to give you a balanced view of Thomas Jefferson and talk to you about the Jefferson Bible, where he excised uh, certain portions of Scripture said that didn't match his, uh, his belief of who Christ was, so forth. Essentially, the religion of Thomas Jefferson, he was a Unitarian Universalist, and that's essentially what he believed. And, of course, you'd have to get off into a separate thing altogether to understand. I'm sure you understand much of what that means tonight. A Universalist means that he, everybody's going to be saved, even the devil. A Unitarian denies the deity of Christ, says that there is only one God, God the Father, but no God the Son. That's a Unitarian. I'm a Trinitarian. I believe in God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost comprise the Godhead. The word Godhead shows up twice in the New Testament, and each time that it shows up, it has a direct, distinct reference to the Pleroma. The Pleroma is the thing that the Gnostics talk so much about in, the, uh, in their Gnostic writings, and that is the fullness. It is the fullness of the, of, the, of, of, the, of the universal spirit, the universal life force, when it comes in its fullness. That's the Pleroma. The Apostle Paul, when he wrote the book of Colossians, it said in him dwelleth the fullness of the Godhead bodily. In plainer words, you're talking about a non-existent piece of garbage compared to the Son of God, who is God Almighty, all wrapped up in one man. And that's who the Lord Jesus Christ is. He's God the Son, and he's God Almighty. So when we read about Babylon, we're reading about a, a, an entity that is in Bible prophecy. And, as, you know, last Sunday night I brought you a message about how that we had the blood moons, we had the, uh, we had the Mandela effect, we had uh, all this other stuff that's been coming out recently. And uh, so much of this stuff people are making a pile of money off of, but it's confusing people. Amen. And you seldom ever hear anyone, after they've put this stuff out, you seldom ever hear them come on, come out and publicly apologize for date setting for the second advent, advent of Christ. Amen. Now there's a lot of people out there who are really worked up over September the 23rd and they think something profound is going to happen, that the Lord may even come back September the 23rd. I hope he does, folks. Amen. But what are you going to do September the 24th? Amen. 
What are you going to do the 24th of September if he doesn't come back? Amen. And I've been through this time and time and time again where people set dates and then, of course, they just kind of sliver off into the darkness and you don't hear any more from them when the date is not, uh, when it doesn't match the coming of Christ. So I believe that there has been a concerted effort in the religious community, and I believe it is demonic, to confuse people. And by confusing them, it is beginning to move in the hearts and souls and lives of people in the church to where they're beginning to lose heart. A lot of people are going to lose heart this year now. They're going to lose heart. They're, go they're going to turn away from the church and they're going to go back out into the world when the stuff that these people are, 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 are talking about doesn't happen. Now, right now, they can speak boldly, all right? And I would, nothing, would, nothing would make me feel any better tonight than to be proven wrong. I will be the first one to shout hallelujah, glory to God as we go up in the rapture September the 23rd. Forgive me, people. I was wrong Amen. as we go up. Amen. But I'm not going to mock them the 24th of September. I'm going to simply say, you got to be here and you got to live. And those of you that are arrogant and ramming it down the throats of people, the 24th of September, hope you can man up and stand up and say, I was wrong. Amen. That's part of what this is all about. That's part of what it's about. Did you know that in this country, according to the figures, and they are very conservative, that there are probably 25 to 35 million people hooked on illicit drugs. And the figure may be higher than that. The figure may be well into 15% of all the American people are hooked on illicit drugs. And city after city now, city after city, they are they are legalizing recreational use of marijuana. Marijuana is a gateway drug. Marijuana opens the door for harder drugs. That's fact. And, and yet, but do you, 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 have you ever noticed, when was the last time that you saw a governor, a senator, a representative, a mayor, an alderman, or a councilman stand up and man up and say, well, our policies led directly to the mess we're in? No. Amen. Their life is all about being re-elected. That's what it's about. And this is why they never accept responsibility for the laws that they pass. How many of them will stand up and say, we're responsible now for the, for the growth of, uh, of suicide among teenagers because of marijuana or these other drugs, and we could have stopped it, but we didn't stop it. We legalized it, and on and on and on it goes. It's not simple, folks. It's not simple. But the bottom line is that we live in a culture today that has completely turned its back on God and is mocking God, making fun of him and saying, we're going to do it our way, whether you like it or not. And so 25 to 35 million Americans are drug addicts. Here in the last few weeks, you've heard a lot of talk about opioid addiction. You've seen some specials on the local news channels about opioid addiction. They've taken you to recovery centers. They've taken you to doctors and nurses and people that treat opioid addiction. And, they all, and, of course, the idea for the big public service, the idea is to educate the public. All right, that's all fine and well as, as far as it goes. But where did it start? Why do we have so many people today on drugs? Well, let me tell you why they're on drugs. They're on drugs because they've got nothing else. The foundations have been destroyed in this nation. Their faith in God has been robbed from them. And they have nothing in their soul. They're empty. They're void. And so drugs fill up that void Either, be, either to be accepted in a group, a gang, or, or, or for a lot of other reasons. They get hooked on drugs. Sometimes, innocently enough, they're put on painkillers, and the painkillers, you know, they heal up, but the painkiller grabs them. First thing you know, they're addicted to painkillers, which, of course, can lead off into, 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 into the drug world. But the bottom line is the New Testament uses a word, and it's called sorceries. And that's what we read to you here in the book of Revelation. The word sorceries is an ancient Greek word. And, of course, the word sorcery is an English word, but the ancient Greek word it's translated from is pharmakia. And this is where we get the word pharmacy. Now, let me say this right now. I am not saying for a second that a pharmacy is a, is a, is, is a place of witchcraft. Not at all. 
Not at all. I go to them enough. Believe me, I keep, I keep them in business. Huh? You get to a certain age, I so this week you go to the doctor, next week you go to the pharmacy. Week after that, back to the doctor. Week after that, back to the pharmacy. If it wasn't for us old people, they wouldn't stay in business. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Man, I spend enough on drugs. But the bottom line is that 2,000 years ago, pharmacia was connected with sorcery, was connected with witchcraft was connected with the occult world. This is why the word pharmakia is translated sorceries. A sorcerer is a witch that casts a spell on you, all right? This letter that I got, an email I got from a police officer, this is a police officer that's on the front lines, okay? Now, we're not talking about a politician who's running for re-election. We're talking about a man who wears a shield, a badge, and he goes out on the street and he deals face to face with the real world. This is what he wrote to me the other day. And I thought it's quite remarkable because it's quite telling. Listen to what this man says. Now, this is a police officer. He said, Pastor, I'm very happy to have the opportunity to contact you. I'm very thankful for your work. It's had a great influence on my life and faith. I'm a police officer in a major U.S. city. Myself and few people that I work with, medical professionals, police, firefighters, so forth, have noticed a distinct and rapid increase in schizophrenia and other similar illnesses. What's that? That is a split personality. That's schizophrenia. That's when you begin to, like they call, they, some people are diagnosed as bipolar. You can be, you can be a manic depressive. You can be one moment you're, you're a high, next moment you're low. You're one, you're one way this for a moment and then you're complete. You're a docile, gentle person. All of a sudden you become a, a rabid maniac. All right? That's what we're talking about. Now listen to this. He said, suspects, patients often, dare I say, usually have occult books, tattoos, and without exception, use marijuana or illicit drugs. Unfortunately, the city that I serve and protect has embraced recreational marijuana. The city is falling apart. In just a few weeks, I have had several use of forces, foot chases, and assaults against me. This is not unusual, but is unusual for me. I am the officer that is cool and calm. I treat people as I feel is required by my faith. Listen carefully. In the nine years that I have worked as an officer, I have never noticed such a severe change in the behavior of the public. All right, now folks, you're getting it from the front line. You may not have noticed it yet in the, in the circles that you're in, the people that you're around, where you work. This man is on the firing line, and he says that a profound change is taking place right now. Now, there's no reason to believe that the major city where he's a police officer is any different from another major city where, city where uh, some other person is a police officer. In other words, Philadelphia, Chicago, Los Angeles, you know, Detroit, Baltimore, uh, New York, and on it goes, these huge American cities. But it's not always a huge American city. You've got mid-sized American cities, got all kinds of problems, small American cities. It's all over the place. Listen to this. In the nine years that I've worked as an officer, I have never noticed such a severe change in the behavior of the public. I recently had a man who had just killed someone seconds earlier, all right? He just murdered someone. He attacked me. During the fight, I broke his jaw badly. He kept fighting. He was screaming nonsense. It took six officers to take this man into custody. He had strength that I had never experienced. I am, listen carefully, I am a previous professional athlete, a national level competitive power lifter, a trained fighter, and I struggle to keep this man in control. Now we have moved past the physical into the spiritual. And he knows it. We have moved past physical ability. 90-year-old woman, 90-year-old woman, picks up 200-pound man, throws him. Physically, that's not possible. Spiritually, oh yes. 
Oh, yes. Now listen to the police officers. He continues. He said, I had a difference. I had a difference homicide suspect. I had a different homicide suspect run from me. I chased him for six blocks before I was able to catch him. The only reason is that he was unfamiliar with the area and ran into a fenced area. He ran out of his socks and shoes. With the exception of when I trained with Olympians, I have never lost a foot race in my life. This guy was faster than any of them. He's talking about the Olympians. In plain words, supernatural speed. I believe mental illness can be confused with demon possession. These people have strength and speed that is unlike anything that I have experienced. I once was speaking to a prisoner and he kindly asked me to please be quiet so he could hear the voices. Experiences like this as well as others make me feel if the end of this world or this age is near. The world more than ever values things that I don't. Gay marriage, paganism, feminism, racism, etc. If now, of course, let me stop for just a moment, all right? Let me just stop for a moment and say something. As far as the world is concerned, this man is a bigot. All right? As far as the world is concerned, I am a religious bigot. And as far as the world is concerned, if you subscribe to what's preached in this house tonight, you are a bigot. How'd we get there? Had it church going, tax paying, law abiding citizens of this country become so demonized, so labeled in just a short period of time to where now if you believe the Bible and you accept scripture on face value, you are a religious bigot. Are you watching what's going on here now? You had the collision of two forces over here in Charlottesville, Virginia. Two forces. Now you've got one side flying the Confederate flag, the Nazi symbol, and other whatever other symbols that they have, and they are, and and this group is is called white supremacist. On the other side, you've got the progressive liberal crowd. I'm not on either side. I am not a white supremacist. I don't belong to the Nazi party. I don't belong to the Ku Klux Klan. Amen. But if I don't join the party line and walk according to what they say and cross my T's and dot my I's exactly the way the progressive liberal crowd says to do it, I am a religious bigot. Amen. So what's that mean, preacher? It means that they have come to the point in this country where they control your thinking by labeling you, by identity. And if you don't fit where they want you, they shut you up. The First Amendment now officially is still good. But in real, the real practical world, you can't say anything anymore. It'll cost you your job. How do we get here? What is this preparing us for? What does the future hold? What's down the road? Well, it seems to be pretty clear to me that the only religion that's going to survive in this world is going to be religion, it's going to be the religion that is hammered out on their anvil and created by their theologians and fed to the public. Their religion is going to be a universal religion that's going to lay the groundwork for the coming of the man of sin. Now, folks, how many of you tonight really get a hold of the impact of what I'm saying, folks? Oh, we're not talking about 10 years down the road. We're talking about right now. This is where you are right now. We're not headed there. We are there. And so many people say, Preacher, I can't believe it's gotten this far. How much longer is it going to go before the Lord comes back? I don't know when he's coming back. I hope he comes back September the 23rd. That'd be wonderful. <laughs> I'd be the first one to shout hallelujah. Amen. Amen. I'm not against the Lord coming back September the 23rd. But if he doesn't, you've got to live the 24th. You see what I'm saying? Amen. A wise man would take that into consideration. Anyway, he said, if I choose to speak my mind, 
I can only imagine the response and the consequences. Not agreeing, promoting, or accepting something does not make me phobic. It is Marxism to control the language and to control thoughts. This is from a police officer out here on the beat. These feelings and experiences cause me to feel isolated and lonely. Many people don't see it or are afraid to talk about it. My friends are all married with kids or, because have, or some have moved away. Sir, what does the Bible teach about this surge in demonic activity? What specific resources are available to cope with this in my daily life? Are there specific verses that I should learn? Thank you for your time, so forth and so on. <coughs> I feel for this man. I feel for him because he lays his life on the line every time he, he puts... He, he straps on that weapon and puts on that, uh, that badge and goes to work. His life is on the line. Amen. And, you know, we have, uh, what was it, how is it they say it? Pigs in a blanket. Uh, how's that go? How's it go? Pigs in a blanket, fry my bacon, right? Uh-huh. And, and you know who they're talking about, don't you? They're talking about police officers. They're talking about police officers. Now, if somebody kicks your door down at 2 o'clock in the morning, they kick it down. You hear them walking around in your house. Are you going to call your local politician? Amen. Who are you going to call? Amen. It would be nice now if you had Mr. Colt, uh, Mr. Smith and Mr. Wesson, Amen. Mr. Remington, Mr. Winchester. Uh, these are good fellows to have around. At certain times, they really are. <laughs> It'd be nice for you to get acquainted with who I'm talking about. You know what I'm talking about tonight? <laughs> Uh, you know, a few years ago they said that if they give concealed carries out, uh, if, they, if they allow people to carry concealed weapons, it'll be Dodge City all over. They'll be having gunfights on the streets, people being shot dead all over the place. That's what they said 20 years ago. They made movies about it. Do you know what's happened since they've, they've illegalized? The criminals are still criminals, and the law-abiding people are still law-abiding people. That's what happened, and the police know it. It's the politician who panders to the people, who takes one side or the other. They know it. Just because you've got a gun doesn't make you a criminal. No, it doesn't. It doesn't change you. But the issue is very simple. These people are fascist. They're going to control you. They're going to tell you how to think. They're going to ostracize you if you don't march to their tunes. And they're going to completely redefine the English language. All the words that meant something 20 years ago are completely changing now, and they mean something entirely different. Everything is changing around you, and it's, and it's, and it's happening at unbelievable speed. So pray for this police officer. Pray for him. And ask God to, and a lot of others, no doubt out there. And uh, uh, when a few years ago, 20 years ago, 25, I don't remember how many, God's blessed me with a good memory. Can't remember anything. <laughs> Two men tried to kick our front door down. They tried to kick it down. Right up here on Woodville, right up here. They tried to kick it down. They weren't knocking on that door. They were kicking it with their feet. And it held. And I've told you before what happened. I turned the light on, walked into the room, and I had Mr. Smith and Mr. Wesson with me. They're good people to have around at that time of the day. Amen. And I wanted them to see Mr. Smith and Mr. Wesson. I wanted them to see that weapon in my hand. I said, boys, you see this? This is a real weapon. You're not coming in my house. Amen. And I've already called the law, and they're on their way now. And so it stopped it. They didn't kick anymore. Captain Charles Austin in Indianapolis, Indiana. How many of you remember the name? He was the police officer that went to LaToya Ammon's house to investigate the demonic activity that took place in her house and her children were, 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 were possessed with demons. That, 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 uh, that police officer, that veteran police officer went in there and saw things. He thought at first it was a money scam, that they were trying to get notoriety, that they were going to make money off of this, and he walked in there a complete skeptic. And then when he was confronted with a supernatural power inside that house, this police captain came out and said, that is the gate to hell. That is real. 
What's going on in that house is real. One of the kids that came out of that house, when taken into a hospital to be examined, walked up the wall backwards. That's who we're talking about. Just a few days ago, they kicked his door down into his house. They kicked his door down. He came up shooting. It was about 11 o'clock, 11.30 at night. They kicked his door down. Here they came into his house. This veteran, retired police officer, came up with his weapon, and he came up shooting, and they shot back and shot him in the stomach. He went to the hospital, and he's recovering. Pray for him. The thing I thought about, here is a man who went into that house. He was around that demonic activity, and then somebody tried to kill him. He, he, he was on nationwide newspapers, the Indianapolis Star, talking about something that Satan did not like. He was talking about real demonic activity. And the devil probably tried to kill him and shut him up. Because ever since that's happened, I've been trying to do a good bit of research into what's happened since then, how this has developed. And then I just ran across that this afternoon. They tried to kill him. Listen to this psychiatrist, all right? This man is a psychiatrist, MD. It's quite remarkable what he says. His name is Richard Gallagher. He's a board-certified psychiatrist in private practice in Hawthorne, New York, associate professor of clinical psychiatry at New York Medical College. He's also on the faculties of Columbia University Psychoanalytic Institute and a Roman Catholic Seminary. He's a Phi Beta Kappa graduate of Princeton University, magna cum laude in classics, trained in psychiatry, Yale University, School of Medicine. Dr. Gallagher is the only American psychiatrist to have been a consistent U.S. delegate to the International Association of Exorcists and has addressed its plenary session. Here's what he says. Amid widespread confusion and skepticism about the subject, the chief goal of this article, and the article is what follows, and I'm not going to get into all that just for the sake of time. The chief goal of this article is to document a contemporary and clear-cut case of demonic possession. What's that mean, preacher? It means that as highly trained as you can get a psychiatrist, he's talking about demon possession. I'm watching it enter to the church. Religious demons, very subtle, very subtle. You have to be on guard for them all the time. You don't go look for a demon under every rock you turn over, but they're here. They hate us. They hate me. They hate you. There aren't many places left in the country that are preaching the truth about the coming of the Lord. To the police officer, I would say this. Here's what's happening. The vast majority of the people in America have no faith. Their faith has been destroyed by Darwinianism in the public school system. They have no faith. They have no roots. Therefore, they are completely open to satanic possession and obsession. Many people in this nation are drug addicts. Being drug addicts, they open a door directly to, to demonic possession. Drugs put you in an altered state of consciousness. Pharmakia, remember sorceries, drugs, it opens it up, and you can become possessed with a devil, with a demon, a, a diamonion, an evil spirit. Therefore, it is reaching a point of saturation in our nation where people now are, it seems like it is accelerating, where the average American has completely rejected the gospel of Christ and the word of God, and all they think about now is the here and the now. And the, and the self-gratification and their own personal pleasure. And here, right here, right now, and this is feeding a whole nation of people that are coming up who have no roots. The young people are looking for something. And they're coming up and they're experimenting with dope. And they're being sucked into demon possession. And I would say to that police officer and you and everybody else in this country, beware of the group you're around. Beware of who your friends are. Beware of the places you go to. Beware of the music you listen to. Beware 
of what you allow your eyes to a, a, a movie or, or a theatrical production or wherever you might. Beware of these things because the messages are there. You're being, you're being pummeled with it. You're, it's permeating the whole society. It's everywhere. I've never seen it in my lifetime like it is now. But the report from the man on the front lines is now we are encountering people with superhuman strength. And I have never seen, he says, such a change take place as has happened recently here in America. And the politicians, the only thing he's kept, the only, listen, here's the goal of a politician, re-election. That's what it's about, re-election. That's his goal. So the way the wind's blowing, yeah. whatever it takes. Man. Not all of them, but most of them are like that. The only thing they care about is their future, their political uh, fortunes, and re-election. That's where you're headed, and that's where we are. And you're not going to—it's not going—it's not going to go easy with us. It's not going to go easy. They're not—they don't like this. The fact of the matter is, they despise it. But what are you going to do? What choice do you have? Your choice is that you're going to stand true, and you're going to be faithful to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I want you to listen to what I'm reading to you for just a moment because this is important. My name is Keith. I am a former atheist of 35 years who had a supernatural experience 11 years ago that revealed the true nature and identity of God in the fully human and fully divine person of Jesus Christ. God visited him. He made himself known to him. When he did, he changed. The hardest thing in the world as a pastor is to try to reach people with a simple truth. You cannot come to God until God comes to you. You are not the one in control. He is. And one thing that really bothers my heart, and this is why I don't understand some things, because God's the one who holds this in his hand. I know there are people in the church that have never had a spiritual, supernatural experience with God. They've never been born again. I know they haven't. They never have. They never have, and they don't now have any desire for spiritual things they don't have it but because it's your husband or your wife or your son or your daughter or your mother or your father or your family member you will make excuse after excuse after excuse for them if you really love them as much as you think you do or you say you do you would really start praying for them and their relationship with God you really would the pulpits in this country are full. They are absolutely full. And I'm talking about Baptist churches of unsaved clergy. Amen. And I call them clergy because that's what they call themselves. They're reverends. When I ask a man that comes down to join this church, are you saved? And he tells me he's a preacher. I say back to you, we've got a big problem Amen. Amen. we got a big problem whether you're a preacher or not is irrelevant have you been saved now I was 27 27 years old before I had a supernatural encounter with God when I had that folks one moment I was a child full of hell the next moment my life completely changed I've been looking for that ever since then in the religious people around me the church I was saved into down there where Bill Cardwell was a pastor Bill Cardwell a good man good preacher faithful man of God he's gone on to be with the Lord now he's one of those old fashioned open the Bible rare back and preach that's what he was amen we need more of that <laughs> But in my spirit and in my soul, I was around a lot of people who were religious, 
but they were lost. They didn't have the Spirit of God in them. Amen. Has that ever happened to you? Have you ever had a personal encounter with God? You say, no, I haven't, preacher. Good, I want you to be honest. What can I do? Here's what you can do. The Bible says if you'll draw nigh to God, he'll draw nigh to you. If you'll just get on your knees and say, Lord, I need you. I need some help. It's dark where I live. I'm unsaved, and I have no hope. What can I do? I need you to help me. You say that, and I have no reason to believe otherwise that God wouldn't come to you, and God would show himself to you and make himself known to you. Romans chapter number 11, I studied for years, years and years and years, the 11th chapter of Romans. I'm going to say something to you tonight, and I want you to take to heart what I say because I've studied the Bible a long time. When Moses was told to speak to that rock that second time, what did he do? He struck it. Now what happened? Water came out. Do you know why the water flowed? Because God is a gracious God. Grace brought that water out. Moses had a temper. He said, you rebels, you bunch of rebels, and he smote the rock. The water came out. But God took Moses apart one day and said, now Moses, I'm going to do away with these people. I'm going to wipe them from the face of the earth. There'll be no more, and I'll make a new nation in you. That's what he said to Moses. Do you know what Moses said back to God? He said, I'll tell you what. Here's what he said. He said, if you wipe them out and you blot them from the book that you've written, Moses said, blot my name out too. Do you know what God did when he did that? The Lord turned aside and had a smile on his face and he said, I found my man. I've got my man. Are you following me? Moses is willing to die for his people or with his people. The Apostle Paul in Romans chapter number 9 said this. I would be accursed for my people. Romans 9. My brethren after the flesh. I would be accursed. I would let God curse me to damnation and hell fire for my people. The Lord turned aside and had a smile on his face. I found the man. The 11th chapter of Romans is one of the most important chapters in all 66 books of that Bible. You know why? Because the 11th chapter of the book of Romans deals with the Jew and what God did with the Jew and where they are now and what he's going to do with them in the future. And it also deals with the Gentiles. Now, how many of you believe in eternal security? What if I showed you in Romans 11 you could lose your salvation? You say you can't do it. Oh, yes, I can. But on the other hand, that's an interpretation. What I'll show you in Romans chapter number 11 is how that a Gentile that has been grafted into the natural olive tree, a wild olive branch, can be cut out and cut off. The scope of Romans chapter number 11 is not talking about the position of the body of Christ. It's talking about the Gentile nations and the Gentile people as a collective body. God looks in broad terms at things, broad perspective. He's looking at the Gentiles who are not part of the body of Christ. The only way that you'll ever be a part of the body of Christ is to be born again. You've got to be born again. That's the only way. And the only way that you'll ever be born again is if the Spirit of God calls you and draws you. No man can come to me. But the 11th chapter of the book of Romans is talking about the Jews and the Gentiles and the remnant. And he's talking about the future of the Gentiles and he's talking about the future of the Jews. 
And he's saying that a Gentile can be cut off, cut out, and cast aside. That's quite a revelation. Because if you put the church in Romans chapter number 11, then you've got yourself being cut off and cast aside. And that won't work if you believe in eternal security, which I believe in. Because I've been sealed with the Spirit of God and have a new nature. Remade in the image of Christ, in the image of God. So what's he talking about? He's talking about people that are Gentiles. They're not the chosen people. They're the Gentiles. That's where we are now. The focus now is taken away from the church. There are very, very few now in the church that are being born again. But notice that the focus is upon the Gentiles. It's on the Gentiles and it's on the Jews. That's where we are in Bible prophecy and in the timeline and chronology. We are living in the end of the end. And we're living at a time where Gentiles will either be cut out and cut off or they'll be grafted in one of the other. And on which one it'll be. That's a choice that this country is going to have to make. The nation's going to have to make that choice. And every nation will make that choice. And every Gentile will make that choice to either be grafted in or to be cut out. So we make a choice tonight. Do you want to choose God? Do you want the Lord? Do you want God in your life? He won't say no to you. If you want him, he won't say no to you. He won't say no to you. If you're sincere and you're genuine about it, you want God in your life, he won't say no. He'll welcome you. He'll invite you. But I'm going to tell you something right now. Every single member of the body of the Lord Jesus Christ was chosen in Christ before the foundation of this world. But salvation is not limited to the body of Christ. And that's what I've been harping on now week after week after week after week. It's not limited to the body of Christ. Amen. Amen. That's hope for me then, preacher. There's hope for me tonight. Yes, there's hope for you. Yes, there's hope for you. And you can come tonight and you can pray and talk to the Lord and say, Lord, have be merciful to me, a sinner. Amen. And who knows? God's the only one that knows about your name and where it's written. Would you come to him? Would you come to him? Would you ask him? Would you seek his face? Joshua said, choose you this day whom you'll serve. That's a choice we have to make. I made it in 1973. But when I made it, I made it exactly like this atheist did. He came to me in a powerful, supernatural way and drew me and convicted me. Has he ever done that for you? How many times have you said no to him? Are you getting used to saying no to him? That's dangerous. That's very dangerous. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray you'd bless what's said tonight for the glory of God, who hath known the mind of the Lord, who hath counseled with you. Who did you ever sit down with and lay your plan out before and ask any counsel of anyone? Who did you ever sit down with and explain in detail what you intended to do with your creation? None. Only the Godhead. Father, tonight in Jesus' name, I pray for every soul that's heard this word. And they can do something about it tonight. We're there. It's that the darkness is already descending. We're so close. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand up. What have we got, brother? All-American Church Hymnal, page 403. Of September, hope you can man up and stand up and say, I was wrong. Amen. That's part of what this is all about. That's part of what it's about. Did you know that in this country, according to the figures, and they are very conservative, that there are probably 25 to 35 million people hooked on illicit drugs? And the figure may be higher than that. The figure may be well into 15% of all the American people are hooked on illicit drugs. And city after city now, city after city, they are, they are legalizing recreational use of marijuana. Marijuana is a gateway drug. Marijuana opens the door for harder drugs. That's fact. 
And, and yet, but you, 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 have you ever noticed, when was the last time that you saw a governor, a senator, a representative, a mayor, an alderman, or a councilman stand up and man up and say, well, our policies led directly to the mess we're in? No. Their life is all about being re-elected. That's what it's about. And this is why they never accept responsibility for the laws that they pass. How many of them will stand up and say, we're responsible now for the, for the growth of, uh, of suicide among teenagers because of marijuana or these other drugs, and we could have stopped them? They do. Amen. 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 <laughs> some folks can sing. Some folks can't sing. I'm one of those that can't. Amen. If I want to torture you, I'll get up here and sing to you. Amen. <laughs> All right. If you have your Bibles, would you turn to the book of Revelation? Chapter number 18 and verse number 23. Yes, sir. Lock you up in a cell and for 24 hours a day for a week, I'll sing to you. <laughs> Revelation chapter number 18 and verse number 23. And the light of a candle shall no more at all shall shine no more at all in thee. The voice of the bridegroom and the bride shall be heard no more at all in thee. For thy merchants were the great men of the earth. For by thy sorceries were all nations deceived. And in her was found the blood of prophets and of saints and of all that were slain upon the earth. Her who? Go back and look at the context. Verse 10 of Revelation chapter 18. Father, I pray, Lord, that you bless your word now as it goes forth. May it fall upon good ground and bring forth fruit in due time. I am tonight privileged just to sow it, Father, just to be a messenger. In thy name we pray, amen. There's quite a number of people who believe that modern America fulfills the prophecy of ancient Babylon and the prophecy of Babylon, the book of Revelation, chapter number 18. You can take a map of ancient Babylon and superimpose upon that map, in other words, a map of modern-day New York City, and it's remarkable at how close they align. And, of course, you know, that's, you say, well, that's an incidental thing. Yes, it doesn't prove anything. Uh, it doesn't prove that America is Babylon. But on the other hand, there's a lot about America that I love and a lot about America that I don't love. I've lived long enough in America to watch it change, and it hasn't changed for the better. It's changed for the worse. What you saw in, uh, in uh, Char Charlottesville, Virginia, how many of you know the University of Virginia is located there? You know that Thomas Jefferson started the University of Virginia. And Thomas Jefferson was a great statesman, brilliant man, no question about it. And no question, he was one of the founding fathers of our nation. But I have tried to give you a balanced view of Thomas Jefferson and talk to you about the Jefferson Bible, where he excised uh, certain portions of scripture said that didn't match his, uh, his belief of who Christ was, so forth. Essentially, the religion of Thomas Jefferson, he was a Unitarian Universalist, and that's essentially what he believed. And, of course, you'd have to get off into a separate thing altogether to understand. I'm sure you understand much of what that means tonight. A Universalist means that he, everybody's going to be saved, even the devil. A Unitarian denies the deity of Christ. Now, there's a lot of people out there who are really worked up over September the 23rd. And they think something profound is going to happen, that the Lord may even come back September the 23rd. I hope he does, folks. Amen. But what are you going to do September the 24th? Amen. What are you going to do the 24th of September if he doesn't come back? Amen. And I've been through this time and time and time again where people set dates and then, of course, they just kind of sliver off into the darkness and you don't hear any more from them But when the date is not, uh, when it doesn't match the coming of Christ. So... I believe that there has been a concerted effort in the religious community, and I believe it is demonic, to confuse people. And by confusing them, it is beginning to move in the hearts and souls and lives of people in the church to where they're beginning to lose heart. A lot of people are going to lose heart this year now. They're going to lose heart. They're, go they're going to turn away from the church and they're going to go back out into the world when the stuff that these people are, 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 are talking about doesn't happen. Now, right now, they can speak boldly, all right? 
And I would, nothing would, nothing would make me feel any better tonight than to be proven wrong. I will be the first one to shout hallelujah, glory to God as we go up in the rapture, September the 23rd. Forgive me, people, I was wrong Amen. as we go up. Amen. But I'm not going to mock them the 24th of September. I'm going to simply say, you got to be here and you got to live. And those of you that are arrogant and ramming it down the throats of people, the 24th Christ says that there is only one God, God the Father, but no God the Son. That's a Unitarian. I'm a Trinitarian. I believe in God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost comprise the Godhead. The word Godhead shows up twice in the New Testament, and each time that it shows up, it has a direct, distinct reference to the Pleroma. The Pleroma is the thing that the Gnostics talk so much about in, the, uh, in their Gnostic writings, and that is the fullness. It is the fullness of the, of, the, of, of, the, of the universal spirit, the universal life force, when it comes in its fullness. That's the Pleroma. The Apostle Paul, when he wrote the book of Colossians, it said, In him dwelleth the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Amen. In plainer words, you're talking about a non-existent piece of garbage compared to the Son of God, who is God Almighty, all wrapped up in one man. Amen. And that's who the Lord Jesus Christ is. Amen. He's God the Son, and He's God Almighty. Amen. So, when we read about Babylon, we're reading about a, a, an entity that is in Bible prophecy. And, as, you know, last Sunday night I brought you a message about how that we had the blood moons, we had the, uh, we had the Mandela effect, we had uh, all this other stuff that's been coming out recently. And uh, so much of this stuff people are making a pile of money off of, but it's confusing people. Amen. And you seldom ever hear anyone, after they've put this stuff out, you seldom ever hear them come on, come out and publicly apologize for date setting for the second advent of Christ.